In this video, let's look at two simple examples involving dry friction. First example: Imagine there's a crate sitting on an inclined surface with the angle theta. The coefficient of static friction between the crate and the surface is mu s. From experience, we know that if the angle theta is small or the surface is flat, then the crate can stay static. However, if the angle theta is big. Or if the surface is steep, then motion could happen. The crate could either tip over or it can slide down the surface. In this example, let's assume that tipping over does not happen first, and we are asked to determine the maximum angle theta before sliding happens. Notice that very little information is given for this problem. We don't know the weight of the crate. We don't know the dimension either. As usual, we start solving this problem by sketching the free body diagram of this crate. Therefore, we isolate it from its surrounding and start stating the forces acting on the crate. First, we have the weight force W acting at the gravitational center of this object. In this problem, because we do not concern ourselves with the tipping over scenario, therefore we do not need to worry about moment equilibrium. Therefore, the actual location of the gravitational center is not important in this problem. Next, we have the normal force, normal to the contacting surface, acting at point O. Again, the exact location of point O is not important in this problem. And lastly, because The impending motion is sliding down the surface. Therefore, the frictional force is tangent to the contacting surface, opposite to impending motion. And now we have completed the free body diagram, and we need to put it in an appropriate coordinate system. We can set it up the conventional way, but for this particular problem, it's better to set it up this way, so that. Both the frictional force F s and the normal force n are easily specified, and the weight force can be resolved this way according to the x y coordinate system we set up. And now we can write the two resultant force equilibrium equations once again because we do not concern ourselves with tipping over in this problem. Therefore, we do not need to write the moment equilibrium equation. So we have the resultant force along the x direction equals to W times sine theta minus F s, and that equals to zero. Resultant force along the y direction equals to negative W times cosine theta plus n equals to zero. And because we are calculating for the situation when sliding is about to happen, therefore. The static frictional force is indeed the limiting static frictional force, which equals to mu s times n. Combining these three equations, we can have mu s equals to tangent theta, and from here we can solve for theta, which equals to tangent inverse or arc tangent mu s. As you can see, this angle theta has nothing to do with the, with the dimension or the weight of this crate. It is simply determined by the coefficient of the static friction mu s. This angle is called the angle of static friction, and for problems like this, this angle is also known as angle of repose. Let's look at example two. There are two uniform boxes. They look identical. They have the same dimensions and the same weight, two hundred pounds each. And they are simply stacked together, one on top of another, as shown. If the coefficient of static friction between the boxes is mu s equals to 0.8, and the coefficient of static friction between the box and the floor is mu s prime equals to 0.5, we are asked to determine what is the minimum applied force P to cause motion. However, this problem doesn't tell us what kind of motion it is. Therefore. We need to first think about how many possible motions are there. So I want you to pause for a minute and ask your, ask yourself this question. So there are four possible motions. First, the top box moves only; it slides on the bottom box, but the bottom box stays static. 
Second, top box tips over, and the bottom box again stays static. Third, both boxes slide together. And lastly, both boxes tip over together. And we're going to calculate the required force P for each of these four scenarios, and then we will compare the calculations to decide what's the answer to this problem. First, let's consider the situation when the top box is about to slide. We complete the free body diagram of the top box by adding the weight, the normal force, the location of the weight and the normal force is not important in this particular scenario because we are not concerned with tipping over. The pending motion is to the right, therefore the static frictional force is to the left. We put it in an XY coordinate system and then we start to write the two force equilibrium equations, resultant force along the X direction, resultant force along the Y direction, and because this is the situation when sliding is about to happen, therefore the static frictional force is indeed the limiting frictional force, which equals to mu S times N. Based on these three equations, we can calculate P to be 160 pounds. For the second situation, top box tips over. Again, we start with sketching the free body diagram of the top box. But now the location of the force N is important because we know that for tipping over to happen, the normal force must be placed at the edge of this box. So in this case, 1.5 feet away from the center of this box. Again, we can put it in an XY coordinate system and start writing the two force equilibrium equations. However, in this situation, the two force equilibrium equations are less useful because Fs does not necessarily equals to mu s times m. This equation mu Fs equals to mu s times n only applies when slipping is about to happen. Therefore, the more useful equation is the resultant moment e equilibrium equation, the resultant moment about point A equals to negative P times one foot plus 200 pounds times 1.5 foot equals to zero. So from this equation, we can solve for P to be 300 pounds. The third situation, both boxes sliding together, is similar to the first situation, except that now both boxes are considered as one system. Therefore, we draw the free body diagram of the entire system. Note that the total weight is 400 pounds, and the normal force M prime and the static frictional force Fs prime, they both happen at the contacting surfaces between the boxes and the floor. And following a similar approach, we can write the two force equilibrium equations and then solve for the applied force P to be 200 pounds. Lastly, let's consider the situation when both boxes tip over together. We sketch the free body diagram by treating both boxes as one system, making sure to position the normal force M prime at the edge of the boxes point B. And as we discussed earlier, the useful equation to write is the moment equilibrium equation. Result in the moment about point B equals to negative P times moment arm 5 feet plus 400 pounds times 1.5 feet. And from here, we can solve for the applied force P to be 120 pounds. Now we have analyzed all four situations. Let's summarize. If top box slides only, the required force P is 160 pounds. If top box tips over, the required force P is 300 pounds. If both boxes slide together, the required force P is 200 pounds. And lastly, if both boxes tip over together, the required force P is only 120 pounds. Through comparison, we know that the last one is the answer. So it only takes 120 pounds to move these boxes, and what's going to happen is both boxes will tip over together. If you're wondering, well, I understand why the top box moves, because we applied a force P on it. But what makes the bottom box move? Well, if we draw the free body diagrams of the two boxes separately, 
then we know that there will be normal forces and frictional forces between these two boxes, and they are simply actions and reactions. Therefore, they are of the same magnitudes. They apply at the same point, and they are of opposite directions. Therefore, it is this frictional force, the force exerted by top box to the bottom box, that makes this bottom box have a moving tendency to the right.